Hmm. What? Look, I'll do work overalls, but I'm still gonna wear this jacket. The Caretaker. And I know I've done some complaints as we've gone into Series 8 so far, here and there, but they've mostly been complaints with some high points. Like, I complained quite a bit about Listen, but I also pointed out some of the things that were really good, whether they be core ideas or really good moments. This... This feels like one of the first episodes that there isn't a lot to recommend it. I don't think it's awful, necessarily, and I'm not even sure I'd go so far as to call it bad. I think it's unremarkable. For me, personally, it registers as worse than that because it plays into some things that I just don't like when they get applied to Doctor Who, and a lot of that has to do with tone. This thing, in a lot of ways, and this had never occurred to me before, maybe mainly because I don't really think about this episode <laughs> as, a, uh, as a general rule of thumb, but it occurred to me that tonally it feels a lot like The Lodger, the Matt Smith and James Corden episode, the first one. Uh, that they were in together. It has that vibe on multiple levels in terms of the Doctor in an environment that he's obviously not totally comfortable in, trying to be normal while tracking down an alien something or other. And it also... <sighs> this is going to be a weird nitpick for me. I also hated the music, and it reminded me of the music uh, from a lot of The Lodger as well. I rarely complain about Murray Gold's music. I think Murray Gold did very good work. But there are some times when he goes for this light, bouncy... It's not even like lighthearted, but like... Doo, dee -dee, dee -dee, kind of sound. It... it Reminds me of like the kind of music that John Williams makes when he's soundtracking characters like Jar Jar Binks. It's that kind of music. He uses it in The Lodger. He uses it here. He actually uses it for Donna Noble's score as well, which I don't, I also don't like. It's about the only thing I don't like about Donna. I don't like the recurring theme they were using for him. I, I didn't like it at all. So I don't like the music in this, which is a rare complaint for me. Um... It's, yeah, that just doesn't work. And there's just a lot of bits and that just don't come together. Some of them, the major element, elements, some of them relatively minor. That said, it starts out well. The opening sort of montage of Clara juggling being with the Doctor and trying to have a home life is actually kind of interesting. And I think it's pretty well done as an introduction to get a sense of what a day for her is like and this sort of leading a double life in the most literal sense because she's basically having a full day with the doctor and a full day, you know, trying to be with Danny and TC's kids or whatever back to back on a fairly regular basis. And I think that did a good job of, of displaying that and showing that. And I dug that. I, that was that was a good opening. I wish that that kind of vibe had had held throughout. Instead, we get weird, awkward humor like the Doctor misconstruing who Clara's dating, and and we also have the recurrence of the the patronizing and the belittling of soldiers, which I brought up in Into the Dalek where it got seeded, and. I'd forgotten how mean the Doctor is to Danny. And again, let's be clear, this Doctor is grouchy as a rule. He's grouchy towards everybody, but like, if you want to contrast the difference between being grouchy and being mean, look at how he talks to Courtney Woods, the, the girl who comes in and like he has some interactions with... And later, at, towards the end of the episode, he actually takes in the TARDIS. And how he acts towards Danny Pink. One is dismissive, not really taking her feelings into account, treating her like she doesn't matter all that much. And the other is being actively cruel and mean 
towards somebody. And there is a difference there, and I, I don't like it. I will continue to argue that it doesn't track and they haven't accounted for it properly. I get the doctor being skeptical of military at all. I get the doctor absolutely being fearful of anyone who is going to be armed with a gun who is likely to have a first response of pulling that gun out and using it. I get that. But Danny is not currently in the military. He was a soldier. He is now a teacher. He doesn't currently, currently have a commander. He doesn't currently have a gun. He has chosen a different way of life. And even though I can buy the doctor being skeptical of soldiers and the military in general because of how it tends to exacerbate the sorts of situations he finds himself in, he's still worked with military people. He knows that they are capable of being good, rational people and doing the right right things, or that they can at least be talked into doing the right things. We have seen him across Classic and New Who do that with various characters, from the Brigadier to Ross and the Sontar and Two-Parter, which I already cited, to his own daughter, Jenny, who he initially dismisses because, not just because that she's a soldier, but because she pops out of a machine literally designed to be nothing but that. I get that the doctor is dismissive or cautious or just unsettled by soldiers. I'm not okay with the doctor deciding that, well, that is all they are. That is all I will consider them to be. He's not even currently a soldier. I don't care. He was one once. For the doctor to start taking it to that level, first of all, I just don't enjoy watching that. I don't appreciate it. And in addition to that, I do feel, given the character's history across other regenerations with interactions with the military, you need to justify it if it's going to be that deep run that he will behave that way even towards someone who is no longer actively serving. Heck, Wilf was in the army. And yes, it gets established that Wilf never actually shot anybody, but he was still a soldier. He still joined up. He still was trained. The doctor didn't treat him like crap for that fact. He doesn't know whether Danny ever shot anybody. He wasn't that little annoying kid who asked that question. I'm dwelling on this. It really irks the crap out of me how that entire element was handled. And again, I understand why it's there in terms of the doctor coming to terms, you know, having an initial clash with who Clara's dating and where Danny Pink's story goes in the end. So I'm not even going to say that it isn't worth it and doesn't pay off in some way, but I just hate the way this is handled initially. I really do. And I've spent way more time talking about it than, than uh, I probably should. So let's, let's move on. So I'm just going to, at this point, I'm just mainly going to be listing things that also didn't work. There's going to be a handful of things that I kind of liked and a lot of things that both small and big that just don't work for me in this episode. There's some weird stuff like with the tech going on. Like, did I miss before? Did Clara ever snap open the TARDIS doors before? Because her just doing that casually, I don't like that. Like, that's not something a companion should be able to do. And I, and I know, like, Clara's more entwined in his timeline and everything and also Moffat was so clearly in love with Clara that she's the most amazing companion person ever and of course she can do things that the, that normally only the doctor could do or actually not even the doctor himself could do until his 10th friggin incarnation but whatever since when that invisibility watch that was kind of a dumb idea I well I'll backtrack it's not a bad idea in episode and it's actually used fairly decently I like the idea that uh, Clara sneaks Danny onto the TARDIS so that he can hear Clara and the Doctor interacting and the Doctor knows he's there right off. I actually kind of like the use of it, but just as a thing that exists, that's an overpowered piece of tech which never comes up again because it can't. Because if the Doctor could just literally turn himself invisible whenever the heck he wanted, like that would, that would be possibly even more overpowered than the sonic screwdriver. So the fact that that gets introduced in, in this like at all i'm just like uh no the design for the creature the blitzer doesn't quite work there's i think there's something overly stiff 
about the movements of the lower half and some and the upper half is a bit more organic with its movements and i i suppose that could be more complementary in terms of like a you could almost get something unsettling with feeling like the upper and lower halves are almost thinking independently but like it's like it's on rails, the way that thing is shown moving across the floor. They're probably trying to make it look efficient, but it just looks like a really stiff realization, and that that doesn't quite work. Oh, also, what is it with, and this is not unique even to Doctor Who, but what is it with evil robots or alien robots or pieces of technology always announcing what they're doing? Incoming stop identified. Peloton, Peloton, commence retargeting. Scanning, targeting, destroy. Like, look, I'll give the Daleks a, a pass on exterminate because, like, that's not just something they're doing. That's a life philosophy for them. But, like, what, what is it with, with robots uh, that are, like, just announcing loudly everything that they're doing? Why would you design a machine to do that? I know why, it's so that the audience knows what they're doing, but you know what? We're not that dumb! Uh, I mentioned the romantic, the misunderstandings before, which is just, it's... And like, that's that's the kind of nonsense I hate. That, that kind of nonsense is why I hate romantic subplots most of the time. So, uh... Um, I actually kind of like the introduction of Courtney Woods. I actually kind of like the feel and the vibe she has with the Doctor. And I kind of like that he takes her just to see him dispose of this thing and she throws up. I don't know why, like I can't really justify that. I can't actually say that that was a good idea or a good move or that she been a, or she brought a lot to the table. Like, there's nothing that I can explain why I like it, I just kind of do. I think it's just the chemistry between her and Capaldi kind of works in this episode. So I'm all right with that. I do like that Clara really does pull out the, uh, what I'm just going to call the big teacher energy um, with with the doctor when interacting with him when he really frustrates her. She just, like, my partner Liz is an educator and, it, and it's not that far from like stern parent voice, but you know, because with educators, it's not your own kid. So you have to like, you have to bottle up a little bit more tightly, but you're like, oh no. No, you listen to me right now. And I like when she brings that energy to to her interactions and to the doctor, which is another way that making her a teacher has bled over into her characterization in a positive way. It's a good thing. I wish she had been more this fully characterized when she was introduced in series seven, but whatever. And yet at the same time, she tries to pull this whole thing. Oh, it's a play. We're her seeing her a play. I'm like, what? How stupid do you think I am? Like, thank God Danny doesn't believe her, even for an instant, but like, th the fact that that, ev that joke even went on for as long as it did, or for longer than two seconds, honestly, for longer than the line, it's a play. The fact that it wasn't immediately shut down after that, it, it just feels insulting to me. And, oh, finally, look, I know Danny's a soldier, or was, since when does soldier mean gymnast or parkour? Excuse me? I buy that he's in good physical shape, but that thing was like six feet tall and he jumps over it and flips over it. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish I could say that that shows a high respect for the uh, abilities of a soldier, but I, that just seems to not, not understand you know, <laughs> what the skill set of a soldier would be. Uh, I think that's it. This thing is just clunky. It's just clunky, it doesn't come together. Now, if you enjoy this kind of vibe, the sort of more lighter, bouncy, kind of, kind of not particularly serious, cl clear from the tone that we're not taking things all that seriously, and we're doing really low stakes, even though we say it's gonna destroy the world, like, don't worry about it, kind of vibe that it's going for with the romantic comedy style elements. Maybe you'll get more out of this, but I can't imagine this is anything that anyone is going, oh, this is such an underrated episode, I love it. Although, knowing me, I'll still get a couple of comments that actually say that. I don't get it. 
I just, I just don't. And there's, there's so many small things that are just infuriating about this thing. The Caretaker. You rewatched it lately? What'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something on down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Usual stuff to do. You know what it is. Like and subscribe and all those things. I have a Patreon. All the more important these days. I'm, I'm not employed anymore. But, the, you know, there's that and links to social media and all sorts of stuff. Check them out. Give them a look. Or don't. <laughs> don't sweat it. It's not that big a deal because I can't tell you what to do. End of the day, you're the council. I just run the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.